the, the uh, I'll now call the workshop to order at uh, 4 o'clock p.m. Ms. Bellotta, would you please call the roll? District 1, Barbara McQuinn. Here. District 2, Alexandria Ayala. Here. District 3, Karen Brill. Here. District 4, Erica Whitfield. Here. District 5, Frank Barbieri. Here. District 6, Marcia Andrews. Here. District 7, Deborah Robinson. Absent. We have quorum with six board members in attendance. In attendance also joining us is Superintendent Burke, General Counsel Bernard, Inspector General Michael, and Board Clerk Tony Bellotta. Senior staff members will join us periodically as directed by the superintendent. I ask all of you to please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance to be led by the superintendent. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, Thank you. Viewers and listeners can access the meeting today by either watching on Comcast channels 234 and 235, UVerse channel 99, or by using the YouTube link on our webpage at palmbeachschools.org. In the event that the link is interrupted for technical reasons, please switch over to the TV channels. All board meetings are recorded in their entirety and posted on the district website within 24 hours. We also offer a listening only option which the public can access by calling 561-357-5900 or toll free at 1-866-930-7015. The meeting ID is 1561-880-1124 pound sign. This meeting is being transcribed by a closed captioner, so please remember to speak at a reasonable pace. On behalf of the board, I'd like to welcome any public speakers who are joining us today. The school board supports the peaceful assembly of persons to express themselves regarding matters concerning district students, employees, and the community. Please adhere to the safety protocols that were provided to you upon entry and which outline in more detail what is expected. As a reminder, public comments must relate to the subject matter of the agenda item for which the speaker had requested to address. Pursuant to school board policy, speakers whose comments do not relate to the topic that the speaker indicated including but not limited to the mention of any person's candidacy for elected office are subject to having the microphone turned off and forfeiting the right to speak at the remainder of today's meetings. Again, your attendance here at the board meeting is appreciated. Thank you for helping us to maintain decorum, civility, and the orderly conduct of school board business. Mr. Superintendent. Yes, thank you. We have two workshops this afternoon. Um, recent legislation both last year uh, and in the more recent legislative session has prompted the development or creation of a new board policy, 5.735, the Parents' Bill of Rights. Uh, we're gonna workshop, workshop that policy here today, and I'm gonna turn it over quickly here to Dr. Glenda Sheffield, Attorney Lisa Carmona, and Assistant Superintendent of Teaching and Learning, Diana Fetterman. Mr. Superintendent, before that, um, since you announced with the, uh, which, which workshop we're on, we have three speakers for that workshop that we'll oh, listen yes, to first. Yes, thank you. Um, they'd be Emmy, the, the speakers are Emmy Kenny, Jen Showalter, and Justin Katz from CTA. Would you please come up to the podium, watch the clock, state your name, we have three minutes. Yes, ma'am, I'm sorry, the microphone there, yes. Hello, Superintendent Mike Burke, board members, district staff, my name is Emmy Kenny, and I'm here once again to speak in defense of trans youth, the kids and teenagers in Palm Beach County schools and beyond. This policy, this law, it makes me sick to my stomach. It literally keeps me up at night. It hurts me because unlike the people who wrote this bill or have an opinion on this, who voted on this bill, I've actually met a lot of trans kids. I've worked with them as a mentor, as an art teacher. I have a lot of trans friends. My first love and soulmate was trans. And I was with him for six years, and that's where I saw what trans people go through in this world. And I do this work because like so many trans people, he's not here today to do that. I understand that your hands are tied in certain ways when it comes to this. <laughs> However, the stakes are so high that if you are going to so willingly comply with an unconstitutional discriminatory law like this. You have got to one, learn exactly what is in this and what is not, and what is prohibited and what is not. 
Because when you play it safe, you're not playing it safe for the students. You're playing it safe for, for the district to not get sued. And you also need to mitigate the harm that this is going to cause, the exclusion of LGBTQ stories for kids. You need to mitigate that harm by doing some of the things that we have been asking you to do for years. Gender neutral restrooms. Policies that encourage teachers to use the correct name and pronouns for students at school. That's not illegal yet. Basic, basic bare necessity is teacher training. I just reviewed the suicide prevention training, the two hour training that all teachers are required to take. There's not one mention of transgender students in that training, even though trans youth are four times more likely to commit suicide. The only comment about LGBTQ students at all was that there's conflicting statistics that gay and lesbian students or youth are likely to attempt suicide. We know that's not true. I think this training was made in the late 90s, maybe the early 2000s. There's very simple things that you as a board, you as a superintendent can do to mitigate some of the harm that this will cause. You have my contact information. You have Compass. You have people who are willing and ready to work with you. Please utilize us. I can't stress how, how near and dear this is to my heart. I have kids calling me and asking me what this means for them. And I don't have good news. And I want to give them something. There's a student in Palm Beach County right now who spoke with Mr. Burke at the Compass Town Hall, explained the bullying harassment she was experiencing at school. The school <laughs> blamed it on the trans student. Um, and she was threatened with being prosecuted for false allegations. Her mom took her out of the school. She's been in and out of mental health institutions. And I just heard that she ate a bottle of Tylenol last night in yet another attempt to take her life. It's time to act. Ms. Walter. Reset sorry. the timer, please, for three sorry. minutes. I'm vertically challenged, sorry. I'm Jen Schulter, mother of three, here to discuss policy 5.735. This policy has some areas that need clarification. It states in section one that the school board recognizes the following parental rights. A, the right to direct the education and care of their minor children, and B, the right to direct the upbringing and moral or religious training of their minor children. Is the score, school board truly going to recognize those rights because the board has rejected those rights before and is on record stating the board feels it knows what's best for students and violated Florida statutes in order, order to overrule parents in attempting to exercise those rights. The board has acted in defiance of parental rights <coughs> with Superintendent Burke stating on record that school board supporters can give guns, lawyers, and money when dealing with concerned citizens and agreed with the NSBA over the letter to the DOJ. Parents like me for months took off work and provided clear evidence of the detrimental physical, emotional, and academic effects mask wearing caused, but were blatantly ignored or gaslighted in op-eds. <coughs> OTs on record are stating their patients are severely declining and mandates cause significant delays and regression in hearing, speech, and motor. Jacqueline Thiek, a speech and language pathologist in North Palm, told the news she saw a 364% increase in speech issues since the institution of mask mandates causing unprecedented damage. If the board has violated Florida statutes before, why should the public believe it will uphold HB 1557, especially considering the board published an official letter in opposition of the bill? That begs the question, is the school board in favor of the sexu sexualization of our youngest children? Because <laughs> all it says is we can't talk K through three. Those are prepubescent children who don't think about sex. It's not talking about middle school or high school. It oppose, the board opposes this bill. It could mean that they haven't read the bill and simply are following protest trends, or 
maybe it's plausible that they are okay with sexually grooming our K through three students and setting them up to be victims. Carol Lieberman, a board certified psychiatrist said this focus on sexuality is stimulating kids and resulted in a sharp increase in the amount of sexual assaults at school. She also stated that not allowing children to develop naturally is considered child abuse. The board announced concerns about possible LGBTQ suicides, but ignored parents who announced actual suicides of children due to isolation from mandates. The board ignored special needs kids who reports show make 65% of all bullying incidents. They want to have ability to discuss sexual preference and how teachers live their lives according to that preference, yet deny religious discussion. What if a teacher had gone to church, synagogue, or mosque, and then came into class and started extolling the principles of that religion to students? You can't have it both ways. Bottom line, stick, it to, acti stick to academics and let children be children again. Thank you. CTA President, Mr. Katz. Good, af good afternoon. I don't know how to change it, so I'm just going to lean forward. <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is Justin Katz. I'm president of the Classroom Teachers Association. Uh, I came here today to speak on this item because um, I personally come to the conclusion that a lot of what is said about whether it's this topic or any number of other topics in society typically only ends up being spoken about by people who have pretty extreme views on one side or the other. I'm not picking on any one person or any one group, but you hear the loudest people on one side fighting the loudest people on the other side, and oftentimes both versions are distortions of whatever's actually happening. And I've always considered myself a pretty moderate and pragmatic person, uh, so I wanted to try to speak what I thought was rationally about this law and uh, the impact and, and how teachers are going to respond to it. First and foremost, teachers are going to abide the law, and they are going to abide district policy. Um, there are people in society who think things are happening that are not. Uh, there are people in society who think that we need to talk about everything in the world in our schools to children at all ages, and I don't know if that's exactly the smartest decision, too. Um, fundamentally, what this law should have been about is something that's existed forever, and that is for the community and parents to influence the determination of what's appropriate for different students at different age levels, not just about gender identity, et cetera. Um, I just wanted to defend teachers because there was a Facebook post from Michigan that became viral and all of a sudden it was Palm Beach County teachers were not gonna say the words he and she anymore and people took that literally and believe it and use it to vilify the profession, use it to vilify our teachers when I don't believe there is a single teacher in Palm Beach County who's gonna stop using pronouns. I, I don't believe there is a single teacher that would consider it because that is a satirical article. It is meant to be absurd to prove a point about this law and whether the intent is genuine or not. Um, teachers are going to teach. They're gonna abide the standards. They are not going to do things that people think they're doing to brainwash or manipulate kids. It is hard enough to get any given student at any given grade level to listen to the content you absolutely must teach that I don't believe, I haven't seen evidence, except for anecdotally, that teachers are trying to teach or brainwash kids to, to be something or not be something. I, did, I felt the need to speak about this because the perception is from some that this is absolutely happening and it's not. You would see a, a mountain of evidence if teachers were giving inappropriate lesson plans all over the place. And what you more often than not see is isolated anecdotal evidence of a teacher here or there or in California doing something. And I just wish that people that were critical would have accepted the recommendation from some senators in the Republican Party to make this about sexuality in its entirety not focus on one group to try to marginalize them. I just, I just think that teachers need to be defended because this is not what they're doing. They're teaching, they're trying to with what little resources they have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Katz. On the next group of speakers for the next workshop, would you make sure the bell rings at three minutes, please? Thank you. Mr. Superintendent. Yes, so I'm gonna uh, turn it back to Dr. Sheffield and the team. Good afternoon.
Good afternoon, Mr. Bobbieri. I'm Ch Chair, Vice Chair Brill, and remaining school board members, and Mr. Burke, our superintendent. Um, it is um, a, it's this afternoon we're coming before you to do the workshop on policy 5.735, the Parent Bill of Rights. Um, Ms. Fetterman, um, along with Attorney Cremona, our attorney for academics, have worked very closely together in regards to looking at our recent legislation that is bringing us to the development of this new policy. Um, the proposed policy, of course, as I'm indicating, is on the subject of the Parents' Bill of Rights, and as is detailed in the statute in which we have listed here, and of course around House Bill 1557. It, it is important, and I'm going to stress again, how the school boards have recognized, and we continue to recognize, that our parents, our guardians, and our stakeholders play a fundamental role in the education, the welfare, and the values of our students, and our commitment to educating our students and, of course, being in compliance with state law. In many of the areas that we're going to be talking about pertinent to this particular policy, it's largely we're going to be reiterating existing law, our policies on these particular subject matters that we're going to talk about. Most importantly, in reviewing the, our current policies, we are finding that there is some overlap in some of these pieces that we are currently doing as a district. And we do have a team that we, are, we have established that are working alongside in making certain that we align ourselves accordingly with this particular policy. The purpose this evening to talk about the policy development I want to just start with this first bullet that talks around the provisions of the proposed policy and how we have de we're going to be detailing the proposed on the remaining slides. And following each section of the new policy, you're going to see a summary and an explanation on how, again, the policy is reiterating or reinforcing established law or current policies. I'm going to start with section one. I think we have three or four sections here. Ms. Fetterman is going to assist me with the sections. But in starting with section one, we want to just look as it pertains to the definitions in itself, because that's where we do get some of the confusion. But most importantly, we're going to be providing the definition of the parent and legal guardian, also providing the definition of instructional materials. And in part, as items have intellectual content that by design serve as major tools for assisting us in the instruction of a subject matter or a particular course. And again, this is all coming from the various statutes that we are working with in making certain that we remain in compliance here as a district. So at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Fetterman. She's going to take us through Section 2, which starts with the parental rights. Good afternoon. So as Dr. Sheffield uh, explained, when we go through each of the sections, we are summarizing them. Uh, typically, we like to give you exact bill language on the slide. This policy, though, is a little lengthy, so we have the, the policy attached for you, and then we're just providing some summaries on the slides for you. So section two details the parental rights. Part one of section two recognizes each of the parental rights that are specifically enumerated in statute 1014.04. So that particular statute lists out several parental rights, so we follow in suit and list out those same parental rights in part one of section two. Then in part two of section two, we do make a note as to the statute that district, district employees, law enforcement, a court or state employee responsible for child welfare is not prohibited from acting in their official capacity. And then the third part of section two states, um, again, just as it does in the statute, that district employees may be subject to disciplinary action if they encourage, coerce, or attempt to encourage minor students to withhold information from their parents. And again, that is from the statute. And then once we move on to section three, section three covers the notice of parental right to involvement. So part one of section three 
um, lists out all of the different board policies for parental rights of involvement that we already have here in the school district, and we have aligned them to all of the different aspects that are covered under statute 1014.05. Part two of section three discusses the publication information that the statute requires us to do. So we've noted where we are going to publicize this on our district website. And then part three of section three details for parents how they can request information about this one particular section of the policy and how they can make appeals to the board. And again, it follows what is listed out in the statute. Our final section is section four. This section covers student welfare and classroom instruction. So part one talks about uh, any change in the student's mental, emotional, or physical health or well-being. The principal or designee will notify the parent or guardian. Um, additionally, school staff shall encourage students to discuss their well-being with their parents. Part two of this section discusses classroom instruction in grades K to three, and that classroom instruction will not include discussions on gender identity or sexual orientation, and discussions or lessons on these topics in grades four to 12 will be age appropriate and developmentally appropriate. And parents or guardians of kindergarten through third grade students will have copies of health screening forms and provide permission prior to administration. And then all parents will be notified of health services offered at their child's school, so they can then in turn give uh, permission to or give either acceptance or decline. And part three of section four, there are detailed procedures if parents have concerns related to section four in order to meet the guidelines of new house bill 1557. And then our final slide there that we have for you just details the next steps of our policy procedure, our date to come back to you for development, and our date, our proposed date to return for adoption. And at this point, we look forward to hearing your feedback. Ms. Ayala. Thank you. So I have a list of questions, if that's all right. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, thank you for going over that with us. Um, so uh, looking at the policy, um, to start with the first question, um, there's a, a section that says that it will require district employees to notify parents promptly if they suspect that a criminal uh, offense has been committed against their minor child. I was just curious in terms of responsibility on district staff, because I know that in a later section it talks about um, recommendation for designating someone who will monitor the email as well as compliance with these these requirements so I just wondered in terms of district staff responsibility are we looking at adding some duties to folks on campuses or creating new positions and what's just what's their threshold where they could get into legal trouble if they don't do something that this law outlines I have concerns about that So I'm going to take a stab at this. The, I don't think this one's working. The, um, the duty to report to parents first is uh, statutorily required. And what that means is that um, parents would now be notified by school staff when something, when their child is involved in an incident, uh, when the child is a victim of an incident of a crime. If there were a crime to be committed on campus, the parents would be immediately notified. Um, the school would not delay in notifying those parents. Uh, sometimes there are concurrent notifications that happen, DCF, school police, uh, all those agencies that would need to respond to a particular situation. In this case, um, schools will be reminded, as they typically do now, that they must uh, contact the parents as well. Is that different from what we do now? Aren't parents immediately notified of any kind of concern to that level? It is my understanding that when concerns arise to that level, it does. Again, this is a statute that codifies many of the practices that were already embedded in the district. Okay, thank you. Um, 
another question I had was where it talks about potential for disciplinary action against district employees. How is that expected to be monitored and enforced? Uh, when they, it, it um, encourages uh, or has a potential for disciplinary action against any employee that encourages, coerces, or attempts to encourage a minor to withhold information. Is this something that we've seen happening? And who's responsible for knowing what kind of communications happen where this is required to be enforced? Well, I can answer that. I, I mean, as far as disciplinary action, it would follow the normal process that we have for any other uh, employee infraction that would go through the disciplinary channels through our um, professional standards. So this would be handled in the exact same format, um, depending on who it who who brings it to the principal's attention or to the regional's attention. Whoever receives the information would have the same obligation to report it through the proper ch proper channels through professional standards, and then it would go through the typical process. So again, it's really codifying. Um, what's already in place, but it's establishing one more basis um, to, um, you know, to, uh, to, for an employee to be subject to discipline if they are found in violation. Okay. Um, next was there was a school review committee. Do we know what, who the members of that committee would look like and who would choose? Um, under the proposed policy, it says that school principals are required to convene a committee. Who would be on that? So for the school review committee, we modeled it after our uh, different policy that we currently have, and I believe that's 8.1205, um, where we do a review of instructional materials. So for this particular school review committee, the, um, there are several different people that would be on it, um, and it, that starts on line 279, or yeah, 278. So the principal or his or her designee shall convene the school review committee. You have one teacher in the appropriate subject area or grade, a staff member knowledgeable of the student, a library media specialist, if applicable, a school counselor, a representative designated by the regional superintendent, and a representative from the appropriate district department. I see there. Thank you. Yep. And then last two, promise. Um, I know that we haven't received DOE guidance for this yet. It says that we're looking at 23. So my question is, um, First, I believe this law doesn't go into effect until July 1st of this year, correct? Correct. Yes. Okay. Um, so knowing that and then moving forward to where we will not have guidance for this, what's the plan for the time in between? Well, the plan for the time in between is that we've, we, have worked, we have done a project management aspect, a scope, to where we, are de we have developed a framework that we are going to be utilizing not just for this particular House bill here, but all of our legislative actions that must be taken place and be ready for our prior to July 1. And the first committee meeting, we actually met this morning. Um, and from that, we are digging deep. And from that, we will develop the subcommittees. And we are working this out backwards to make certain that we are um, in compliance. Got it. Thank you. And finally, uh, if there are folks that are found in violation, where will funding come from to pay for damages, court costs, and attorney's fees if it's an employee that is in violation? Is the state providing that funding? No, they are not. No, it would have to come from the school board's budget. We have a budget set aside for that? <laughs> no, we have a budget for legal settlements, but it did not envision this type of uh, activity. Thank you for your questions and your work. Mrs. Andrews. Thank you. Uh, Thank you for your information and how you've laid it out really uh, clearly, but there's going to have to be a lot of training for staff. So I was just wondering about the professional development that you're going to be able to give to the school centers so that they'll be able to follow through with this. And for parents who may not know about this bill or may not know what their rights are, how are we going to make sure that uh, we recognize them and give them an opportunity to know this is something new and for them to know what their rights are as it relates to this policy as well as this bill? I mean, it will go back to my earlier response um, around the, the scope. I'm in the project management aspect. And part of that diagram as it pertains to looking at the big picture around all of these pieces and the big bucket of work, communication and professional development as one of those subgroups. And so from that, we peel back the layers 
And when we talk about the communication per se, it's from our, you know, our teachers, our district staff, all key stakeholders, including the community at large. When we go back to talking about the training, the training comes from that, that bucket um, and that Venn diagram around professional development. So when we venture out that, when we venture out the Venn diagram around professional development, you will have a STEM that will probably talks about training and what the training aspect will need to look like, who is doing the training, and so forth. So this is the piece that we are currently working on. And we, are, we will be keeping the superintendent abreast um, as we work through all of these pieces. And it was important to bring together a group because we are looking at it from in an entire system because this is not just impacting us here um, at the central office, it's also impacting our school centers as well. So it's important to be inclusive to make certain that we have all those key stakeholders. And so from the big group, then comes the subgroups. Any other questions, board members? Mr. Superintendent. No, that'll conclude the workshop. Thank you, Dr. Sheffield and the team. Our next workshop is an update on our strategic plan development. I'm going to invite uh, Mr. Jay Boggess, Chief of Staff, Yvette McLean Pilliner, Director of Strategic Management, and we have Ms. Martha Greenway uh, virtually today. All right, Mr. Superintendent, then we'll take the, uh, while they're setting up, we have seven, seven people that want to speak on this. Um, I'll call your names three at a time. Please come up to the microphone, watch the clock. You have three minutes. Please state your name when you start. David Hansen, Arthur. I'm sorry, that's not, that's not for this one. That's the special meeting. We have no other speakers on this workshop. All right, Mr. Bagas, we can begin the workshop when you're ready. Um, can we check to see we've got Martha Greenway on the line? Um, I want to make sure that she's active. I am here. Um, however, I'm not able to view any of the slides. I don't know if there's a way to project the slides for the people who are on the Google Meet or not. If not, I'll just follow along. I can. Ms. Greenway, I don't believe that that's um, part of today. Um, tech team, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but as it stands, that, that's where we're at. So we'll, we'll move through. Okay. Martha, and I'll cue you as we go. All right, I've got them printed out, so I am all ready. Excellent. Um, good evening, Superintendent Burt, Chair Barbieri, Vice Chair Brill, and school board members. We come to you today um, as an update to our board workshop um, around the strategic planning process and our development around student inputs, priorities, student outcomes, themes, and objectives. Um, our last time before you, we had robust conversation around this journey to this point, nearly a year uh, in the making, coming back March 23rd, and now here before you today, April 13th. As we move into today, kind of framing today's conversation around our agenda, we had made promises to, to engage our stakeholders, specifically our students and our community. Um, we'll start with our sharing of our facilitation of protocol. That will move us into the review and student engagement and our data and really authentically hearing back from our students uh, around what their vision for learning looked like and ultimately what their journey has been to this point. Perceptions around graduate success, what the priority student outcomes mean to our kids. Um, we'll then take a look at the thought exchange distribution um, which closed yesterday and, and really the impact around some of that. Opportunity for additional input for our themes, our, <clears throat> excuse me, our core beliefs and our objectives. We will conclude with next steps and provide time for discussion Q&A. Like we do with anything we do in this system of schools, we start with our mission statement. Um, it is our cornerstone. It is the foundation for our strategic plan. It's something that you as a board have built and that we are living out um, in a very purposeful way, both at a district level and at our school centers. Just to reiterate that the mission of the school district of Palm Beach County is to educate, affirm, and inspire each student in an equity embedded school system. What do we envision? Um, and, and I like to highlight some of these things as, as well as our superintendent that we embrace 
affirm, and inspire each and every one of our students will succeed and flourish. I, I hear Superintendent Berg frequently refer to the joy of learning and getting back to what that really means for each and every one of our kids. That a positive vision for their future is nurtured and that we're ensuring that that's part of this success model. And ultimately, to our community and our families and our students, that we see you. With that, I turn it to Ms. McLean Pilliner uh, to start to walk us through the facilitation protocol. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bogus. Um, on the screen, you can see the facilitation protocol in terms of the schools that we visited on March 24th and March 25th. During the student engagement um, activities, we visited six schools, and that averaged over two days. We had approximately 180 students, averaging 25 to 30 students per school. During our interaction with the students, they were asked questions such as, during your time in Palm Beach schools, what has supported your success in this area? They were also asked what things have gotten in the way of their success in this area. And also, if you had a younger cousin entering first grade next year, and you could create the best experience for them during the next 12 years of school, what would you change or create within this area? During this time, students were given the opportunity to interact with each other and collaborate on their thinking. At this time, I will turn it over to Ms. Greenway to give more details on how the students interacted. All right, well, thank you very much. Um, and this was a very enjoyable project. Uh, we had the opportunity to speak with somewhere between 175 and 200 students across the fifth school. Um, I will also note uh, that as far as we could observe, they were a very representative group of students. Uh, we had uh, some students who, uh, for whom English was clearly not their first language. Um, we had, as I think you'll see reflected in the comments, a student at various levels of academic performance. We had students representing ninth through 12th grade. Uh, and we had students with very different um, aspirations and dreams. And so I think that it was um, an excellent effort to really understand a broad perspective of what your students are thinking. Um, and we used three different interactive methodologies. The first topic was the ideal characteristics of a graduate. Um, and in this process, which was our first activity, um, we allowed the students to work independently, to kind of get them warmed up, if you will, and generate ideas independently, which then they physically grouped together by placing them on a surface. We then moved on to ask them about the priority student outcomes and what the outcomes meant to them. And for this activity, uh, we placed the students randomly in groups, because as you could expect, uh, they generally walk in with their friends and sit with their friends, so we intentionally moved them around. Um, and then they charted their responses. Um, and we asked them for each of the three outcomes to tell us, you know, what would you do, know, or experience? Um, and we divided them into three groups. One group talked about educated, one group talked about affirmed, and one group talked about inspired. And as each group shared their ideas, we invited the remainder of the group to add and to discuss. So we did hear from every school on every topic, and all students had an opportunity to engage. The last conversation around the strategic themes and objectives um, is really geared towards supporting the next step of the strategic planning process. Uh, when you will build out the more concrete initiatives and projects to realize the objectives. So we again randomly group them, and then we ask the questions that um, Ms. Uh, McLean Pilner just went over uh, regarding what things have supported your success, what things have gotten in your way, and then what you would change for a younger cousin who might be coming behind you as far as their entire educational experience. I will say regarding the strategic themes and objectives, because we're not going to dig into that specific information right now, because it really informs the next step. However, the student comments and insights greatly affirm that the strategic themes and the objectives that have been presented in the draft strategic plan framework are on the right track and really do represent the things that they are um, concerned about, but also that are important to them. 
Before I go into the findings, I do just want to make one other comment, which is that we were very careful in our group to maintain the anonymity of the students. We did not audio tape or videotape any of our groups. Uh, we asked the students to introduce themselves by first name only with their grade level. And none of the input that we received is attributable to any individual student. So those were the approaches that we used um, in, the, in the meetings. And I will also say um, that there um, were no school-based staff in the sessions that we held to ensure that the students did not feel in any way constrained uh, by the comments that they, about the comments that they wanted to make or the insights that they wanted to offer. So if we can go to the next slide, please. So at this point, I am going to summarize the student engagement. Um, we reviewed every single post-it note, um, every single comment that was offered. Um, we have grouped these and are sharing with you the predominant themes uh, that we heard. So in response to the first question, when you graduate, what skills or knowledge will you need to be successful? So this was our effort to really understand from the student's perspective, what is an ideal graduate? So the, this chart shows you how the ideas they generated independently were categorized. The number one category, and this was true across all six schools, for the preponderance of ideas is around financial literacy. And this stems from everything from having the ability to generate a living wage, a good source of income, understanding of business and marketing, to mechanical things around personal financial responsibility, such as budgeting, paying taxes, saving, managing my money, maintaining my credit, managing my credit, building my credit, investing, paying my bills, finding insurance, buying a house. These are things that are very top of mind for all of these students um, as they think about embarking on life on their own. Now, we don't know if this has somehow been exacerbated by some of the current economic situation or any stresses they might have experienced in their family or among uh, their friends over the last two years, but it is clearly on their mind um, and something that they really want to be prepared to do. The second category were things that we have labeled self-management. And so these are uh, generic skills um, for ensuring that they can get done the things they think are important. So this does include setting one's goals and being directed toward goals, but it also includes things such as having a good work ethic, being disciplined, maturity, having a good mindset, perseverance, time management, learning not to procrastinate, um, being self-disciplined, responsible, patient, open-minded, and also the ability to maintain balance uh, between work and the other things that they think are important in life. Academics had 24 mentions, um, and the things that were mentioned in academics were primarily around uh, reading, math, and science. Uh, communication also came up quite a bit, um, and often this was just the word communication, uh, but they also talked about being able to not only articulate their ideas, but being able to express their emotions and their opinions um, correctly, uh, one post-it note said. Um, so to do so in a way that was well received um, without uh, putting people off, if you will, is important skill for them to learn. College and career readiness really ran the gamut from moving directly into a career and also into college. Uh, but they are feeling like they need to better understand how to navigate those systems. So how to navigate the college process, the application process, scholarships, how to navigate getting a job, whether they pursue that first through college or directly, how to write a resume, how to interview, how to manage applications. The mechanics of that process is something that they want to understand. Social skills, including networking, people skills, working with others. 
you'll see a category of topics on the right hand side of this slide that all received kind of a smattering of comments, but below the levels of these other top areas. Um, life skills covers everything from uh, cooking to driving. Uh, personal wellness is something that is clearly top of mind for many of these young people, particularly managing stress and mental wellness. Cultural awareness, um, learning about different cultures, learning to speak another language, being comfortable with people of different cultures. Uh, study skills, I will note, everything I've said up to this point came up pretty much universally across all six skills, uh, all six schools, excuse me. Um, study skills came up predominantly at Riviera Beach. And I think part of what we were seeing there is that those students are focused on the more immediate next step rather than longer term aspirations, at least among the group that we talked to. And so figuring out things like getting their work done on time, um, how to get extra credit, um, how to ensure that they were learning what they needed to know, those were top of mind for those students. And then information technology skills also emerged in one of the top categories. So if we move forward, then our next series of questions are around how the students define what it means to them to achieve the three outcomes that we aligned with the board's vision statement of being educated, affirmed, and inspired. And so if we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, with these slides, we have pulled out common thoughts, which are in quote boxes, that are representative of what all the students said. The larger the box, the more predominant the comment. And you will notice in the middle of the slide is this quote, uh, which is actually what someone, what one group of students join, uh, drew on their chart, which is book smart does not equal educated. And I think that that really represents much of the commentary of the students. And again, keep in mind these were high school students um, in terms of what they think they need to be educated. So setting and achieving their life goals really defines for them, you have educated me, you have prepared me. And the opportunity to expand opportunities and quality of life. And then you can see on the side that is commonly referenced as con uh, continuing education and attaining degrees. And many of the students talked about sort of specific areas where they hoped to be able to attain degrees and some of it was more generic. And then others talked about the ability to be prepared to go get a job. But that is how they are thinking of it in terms of being educated. And so underneath this, we see a number of constructs that they think are going to be critical to them in order to achieve those educated aspects. So being respectful, humble, accepting, and aware, and also being able, again, here we see this notion about communicating, quote, properly, intellectually, and articulately. Understanding business and finance, being able to help and advise others. And you'll see this is a theme that comes up in one of the other outcomes as well, that in their mind, if you're educated, then you are someone who is able to then reach out and be a useful human being to other people. And that's a sign of an educated person. Being confident, being a leader. So if you're educated, you have confidence. You understand current events. You connect to different people and cultures. Um, this next comment came up from primarily uh, schools that were predominantly African American, uh, but we did hear that in their mind, if we are educated, we are going to be prepared to navigate racial ins insensitivity, and we will know how to live in a white world. And those are that their exact comments. That we'll be independent, we'll be educated, so we'll be able to live successfully on our own. And we'll be able to learn, apply what we're learning here in high school to real life. So those are the outcomes that they would be looking to in order to demonstrate to themselves that they are educated. If we go to the next slide, the next thing we asked about was a firm. And so the first thing I want to point out is that there's an opportunity for the school district as you really lean into this notion of affirming students 
to define this for them. So we realized pretty quickly that most of the students were not accustomed to the use of the word affirm as a verb. Um, and we knew that because they would ask us what it meant or we would see them once they got in their group, somebody would be looking it up on the phone. Um, so we did start to offer them a dictionary definition of here's what it means to be affirmed. And then they were able to do the, the assignment or the task of really thinking about, okay, well, how would I know then? Um, what would it feel like if I was affirmed? And so again, you'll see that in this case, the quote boxes are all about the same size because these ideas came up pretty much the same amount of time. Uh, but this notion that knowing I am generally okay as a person, I am accepted, I am included. Um, I go back to the statement that Mr. Vaga started with this. You know, I am seen for who I am and that is okay. I'm confident, I am overcoming anxiety, I'm positive, I'm able to hold your own, grounded. And again, here's this notion that if I'm affirmed and I feel grounded and I feel okay about who I am, then I am gonna stand up for others. I'm gonna know how to lift other people up and offer emotional support. If I'm affirmed, I'm treated like anybody else. I'm resilient, I will stay strong. I'll be able to see things that are negative clearly and overcome challenges. Um, people will trust me. I'll be supported, happy and encouraged. Here's this notion, I'll be seen, I'll be heard, I'll be recognized, I'll get positive feedback and acknowledgement, and I'll experience success. And then on our next slide, we have inspired. Um, and so you'll see the quote in the middle, you know, motivated to do anything you put your mind to. And a lot of what the students talked about here were to them being inspired has a tangible aspect. So. If I'm inspired, I'm helped to form a goal for what I want to do in my life. And then I am inspired and given the motivation to attain it. So a growth mindset, resilient, persistent, experience failures, obstacles, doubts. So if I'm inspired, it doesn't matter what gets in my way. I'm going to overcome it because I'm inspired. I'm motivated. I have drive. I'm goal oriented. I'm passionate about something. Here's this notion again. If I'm inspired, then I'm going to do things for others. I'm going to improve my community, make the world a better place, advocate for social issues. And they also talked about the domino effect. I do something good for someone else, that inspires them to do something for someone else, and on and on the dominoes go. Being inspired means being in an accepting and safe environment and not worried about passing and being accepted. Having a purpose or a cause. Personal growth. This was an interesting one. So if they're inspired, they think that that will then motivate them to make better choices. Um, and they talked about having better relationships with people, food, wellness, finance. So being inspired to do your best to reach your goal helps you to manage your own personal choices as well. Uh, creative, forward thinker, constantly educating themselves, enthusiasm. So if I'm inspired, I want to continue learning. I'm, I'm doing this on my own. I'm creative. And then as kind of resonates with some of these other comments, inspired means I am focused on my learning because I want to learn in order to achieve what I want to achieve. And that is what's important to me and not the grade. So that concludes the summary around the priority student outcomes and the ideal graduate characteristics. Um, and we'll look forward to sharing more with you around the implementation of the objectives when we move into the strategic plan implementation design. So I will turn it um, back over to the uh, district staff to um, take us through the rest of the conversation. Excellent, thank you, Ms. Greenway. We appreciate the, the input from our students and the analysis given on educate, affirm, and inspire. I turn it to, to Ms. Yvette Pilliner to talk a little bit more on our thought exchange distribution and uh, the impact that we've had thus far and the closure uh, April 12th. Thank you, Mr. Bogus. Um, we know it's critical as an organization to provide opportunities for our students, our employees, and also parents and guardians and community stakeholders 
to share their ideas, thoughts, and inputs on the proposed themes and objectives. And through that, we partnered with the communication department to launch an extensive and promotional way in which we presented the thought exchange to our community, to our parents, to our stakeholders, and also to our employees. We did it in ways such as this, and many of them are listed on the slides, but I'll only mention a few. District website, the link, all of our district social media platforms, and also we placed hard copies at the food service and transportation um, facilities so that all of our employees would have an opportunity to provide their feedback. I'll now turn it over to Mr. Bogus to review some of the insights from our previous board workshop where you shared your input and so you get another opportunity to provide additional input. So as promised, we, we listened keenly in the last workshop and um, really in taking in all of that feedback both from our students, um, the thought exchange, the idea of the, not only the, the 23rd but also the 13th workshop, you're going to, to have opportunity again to review these student objectives, these themes, the core beliefs, and really we're setting the tone for a, rather than a piecemeal approach, that we would take all of this collective and bring back one package that reflects all of the, the input, the feedback, and potential revisions. So one of the things that we heard with our core beliefs was um, the support of all of our employees who are prepared to support all of our students. That was something that was really impactful to this team and something that we made notation of as part of these core beliefs. The second piece that we heard from our board was the student success is our responsibility. Again, echoing that, that it's a collective, but it's ours as adults, our responsibility from the district perspective. So I'd ask, pause on these core beliefs if there are other impact pieces that perhaps on the, the first go around we didn't get to, to make mention of. This is the, the time that we want to hear input or feedback around core beliefs. Mrs. McQuinn. So thinking through a strategic plan, how are we going to have accountability measures? So th this is the point where, oh, Mr. Burke. Go ahead, Mr. Burke. Um, so this is the point where we're taking in the aspects around feedback and the accountability measures will be part of that conclusion piece where we come back with metrics and all of those. Still on themes and objectives. Other questions? Okay. We'll, we'll move to our student outcomes. Um, when we talk about educate, affirm, and inspire. Uh, the board, or I'll say what we took from board comments was the idea that educate and affirm indicators were strong, they were solid, but we wanted to see expansion of inspire indicators. Um, the idea that students, caregiver, and community satisfaction and engagement were things that we want to see more of in those indicators. Uh, maybe further expansion or clarification of career pathways was part of this. So asking Pause, take a look at our educate, affirm, and inspire indicators. Is there further feedback input that we'd like to, to have seen as part of the, the revision process? Vice Chair Brill. Thank you, and I'm sorry, I'm a slow reader. My, gla my reading glasses are home. So I just want to go back to the other page where we had the proposed core beliefs. Yes, ma'am. I just had one, one word that I wanted to change um, under the fourth bullet, high expectations for both students and employees. I think it should say all students and employees because I want to make sure that we, we do say all students and all employees, but particularly all means all. That means our students with disabilities, our English language learners, um, all students. So I just want to reiterate that and, and thank you for putting this together. Noted. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Bogus. Oh, I'm sorry, Mrs. Andrews, go ahead. And that just goes down to that last bullet where we says uh, prioritizing the needs of all students. It's the same thing, Ms. Brill, mm -hmm. because that's what we're talking about, all students. So you almost can just carry it on out. Yeah, and, and I just, you know, we can't say all enough. Um, just saying that, you know, in the past, 
it wasn't all, and we just need to make sure we're completely inclusive. Ms. Whitfield? I just want to say I think you did a great job on the Inspire indicators. Um, this is something that we you know, talked a little bit about that we weren't totally sure, but I think you really got it there, which is awesome. I was just curious about the Educate indicators where you have um, key milestones for academic achievement. Is that like transitioning from one grade to the next when you're supposed to, or is it uh, passing a test, or is it all those things? How do, how do those look usually? Mr. Burke, you're being yeah. stared at. <laughs> okay. Um, so our, our key milestones are, again, we're, we're setting the, the macro stage for this, and definition of those things, I think, are inclusive to what this team is going to continue to create as part of the metrics. Uh, Ms. Greenway and I have had that conversation throughout this process. Um, Ms. Greenway, would you, would you like to, to further expound on the, the portion of the metrics that we've been discussing and how that plays into this piece of our strategic planning process? Uh, yes. So, um, and um, Mr. Boggess, so I'm not hitting exactly what you have in mind. Please steer me in another direction. But um, I think one of the things that um, we want to ensure is that you have a balanced set of metrics uh, that represent multiple ways to consider the indicator. Um, and so when we look at something such as assessment, um, we want to look at um, you know, obviously proficiency on state assessments and key grades is important, uh, but growth is also an important thing to look at, um, as well as um, being able to consider other um, reflections of student uh, success, um, which may be um, successful transition, uh, for example, from ninth to 10th grade, uh, which is an area where research tells us uh, students are going to drop out that ninth to 10th grade failure rate is a key indicator. Um, so additionally, I think when in the last plan, one of the things that we heard from your um, internal staff is concern about you know, putting a, um, a mark in the stand, if you will, around third grade literacy when students don't just show up in third grade and need to read and learn to read, but that it's also critical to be assessing that literacy progress all along the way. So again, this more holistic perspective that gives the board better data, but also allows the district to understand multiple points to intervene if they are not seeing the results that they're looking for. Um, Mr. Boggess, did I address um, what you had in mind there or is there something more I could add? Yeah, yes, ma'am. You nailed it, Ms. Greenway. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. Questions? So in the next four themes, theme A, B, C, and D, um, we're going to highlight a handful of things. A and B, we didn't hear a, a, a lot of feedback. Um, it was really, I think, we talked through student-centered culture what the objectives were, the belonging and safe, uh, increase student voice and choice in this process, and demonstrate customer service, which is something that, uh, again, I know this board is very prioritization, uh, or is prioritized, and also from Superintendent Berg. Um, if there's any other feedback on this one, um, we didn't capture that, but if, it, if that's input or feedback you'd like to provide today, we'll gladly take it down. Any comments? Yes. Excellent. Theme B, um, similar to theme A, I, I think first go around, we hit, the, we hit the mark with you all, and the idea around academic excellence and acceleration, um, engaging in that teaching and learning, what results will really mean for a Palm Beach County Schools portrait of a graduate. There was conversation around that, and then the de further definition of what that will be that we would accelerate student learning, innovative, equitable, and differentiated approaches, and, and ultimately the idea that when we talk about equitable participation, the clarification being made around AP, gifted, career studies, performing arts, we did hear that back from the board, and we made notation of that as well. Go ahead, Mr. Okay. Uh, theme C, 
<clears throat> we did hear from you, and, and here's what we took away, that we would expand this theme to create a culture of mental wellness for students and employees that would have a more broad-stroked idea, and that culture would permeate throughout our system of schools. Um, continue to increase the comprehensive supports for our students and employees, but also the enhancement of students and employees skills managing their own social, emotional, and behavioral health. Again, that creation of culture that has mindfulness um, for every stakeholder and participant in this system. Mrs. Andrews. This is one that I was interested in from before with the parental piece. I know we say increased comprehensive support for student and employee well-being but I think there's a piece that needs to go in for the families because uh, when we're looking at um, comprehensive uh, mental health and wellness for students, many times it starts right there at the house. And if we don't tag that in with the home and the family, I think we're missing a piece of it. So the student and the employee can be getting it all, but they have to go home. So I would like to see something uh, there for the family. Any other comments? And last but certainly not least, the idea that we have Theme D centered around committed and impactful employees. Uh, I, I think on this one, we heard from the board really uh, an assurance that we're committed to our employees, how we're gaining greater skill sets, um, that we have the resources for their excellence and really that we're having a shared belief system, which goes back to our common core beliefs of who we are uh, as a district and who we are as employees. No comments? Okay. So, uh, school board members, we're at the point of next steps. Um, we've got four bulleted items that really we're coming back with the use of the stakeholders' input to revise the strategic plan, that we would present uh, the thought exchange data, which closed yesterday, and be able to disaggregate that data, bring it back as an analysis to you, what our community has said about where we're at in this strategic plan and their thoughts towards it. It would present revised priority student outcomes, themes, and objectives, again, with all inclusive, the community, students, and the board's uh, reflection. And lastly, bringing it back to Superintendent Burke and staff to develop those initiatives and to achieve those desired outcomes. Mrs. Whitfield and Mrs. Andrews. I just wanted to say, um, I know we haven't said much while you've been going through this, but I think it's, it's very good and I'm really excited about it. So I just wanted to let you guys know, uh, since we're not saying a whole lot from here, um, at least from my perspective, this is, this is great and I'm super excited for the direction that we're headed in. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. This is Andrews. The student voice means everything, and for us to be able to get those precise uh, conversations with them as to what that mission statement that inspires, you know, to educate, to affirm. I mean, to hear what they said, and you dug deep into what it meant to them, and I'm just thrilled that it's going to be in all of those venues that communications is going to put it out there for everybody to see. And as we venture out to work within our community and with our families and they read this, it's impactful. I mean, it's not something that you just want to just take away and start uh, going through the motion of what every student said. When, when we read this today and you heard it, this is what's so important, the voices of the students and, and how they feel about their education and how we can make it happen for them. So just looking at this was so impressive today and pretty exciting. Excellent. Any other comments? Right. Yeah, just I want to thank the team. I too was really impressed with the, uh, the student voice aspect and the work that was done to get that. It really resonated with me, you know, the financial literacy. <laughs> they want to, you know, they want to be productive citizens. They want to learn how to, to, to move on and be independent and uh, to live life. So I thought it was really valuable to us, and that's going to help us shape our initiatives moving forward. So thank you. I had a question. Sorry. 
I just wanted to ask, um, given their priority being that, um, the legislation that is coming down from Tallahassee regarding financial literacy education, I just wanted to put that out there in case there was a way to incorporate um, that message into what we're putting out since it was so important to them. Thanks. Yes, thank you. That concludes our workshops. Yes, sir. All right, thank you both. Um, we need a motion to adjourn the workshop. Motion by Mrs. Whitfield, seconded by Ms. Ayala. Any discussion, all in favor, opposed? Motion carries 6-0. Call the special meeting to order and ask the board clerk to show in the records uh, that we still have six board members in attendance and Dr. Robinson is, is not here this evening. Board members, we have two items to approve the minutes on. Um, we have a motion by Mrs. Andrews, seconded by Mrs. Whitfield. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. We have no items added for good cause. Mr. Superintendent, withdrawals? Yes, I do have one withdrawal. It's uh, OPS 2. All right. Board members, do you have any items you wish to pull from the agenda? We need a motion to approve the agenda as modified by the superintendent's motion by Mrs. Andrews, second Mrs. Whitfield. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Are there any disclosures or abstentions? Board comments, superintendent's comments, Mr. Superintendent? Yes, I do have a couple. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our district assistant principals. Last week was National Assistant Principal Week. They probably didn't notice. They were probably too busy working. Uh, they also were taking care of a lot of testing. So the assistant principals are our heroes across our school sites along with, you know, we've got such great dedicated staff. But I know uh, in working with them over the years what an essential, essential role they play in supporting our principal, working with our parents, working with our teachers. Uh, they really do a yeoman's job. So we're celebrating that. Uh, also, I'd like to recognize on April 6th, it was Paraprofessional Appreciation Day. So we also want to recognize our paraprofessionals that play such a critical role working with our teachers, helping support our students with disabilities. Uh, we, couldn't, we could not get by without them. And then I would just like to wish everyone, um, as we're about to celebrate, if you're celebrating either Ramadan or Passover or Easter, I hope you have a, a you know, nice holiday, enjoy time with your family. And then just as the former CFO, don't forget uh, federal taxes are due Monday, April 18th. So that concludes my comments. Thank you, Mr. Superintendent. Board, board member comments? Mrs. McQuinn, Mrs. Ayala, Mrs. Whitfield? Ms. Sanders. I have several this evening. Uh, first, I'd like to say uh, to Wellington's Polo Park Middle School robotics team, uh, they are state champions. The rockin' robots are state champions. Polo Park Middle School rockin' robots won the title of grand champion. This was the first time any South Florida region team has ever won this prestigious title. And I'd like to ask through the chair to the superintendent, as soon as possible, can we bring the uh, rocking robots to uh, the board so that everybody can see them? Yeah, I'll look into that, try to make that happen. All right, thank you so much. And then another great thing in Wellington that I really want to tell you, I spent some time working with uh, the Wellington Village Council and their staff. The Village of Wellington has partnered with the School District of Palm Beach County to host an academic recovery program and camp this summer. Now we have our own summer school programs, but Wellington has stepped out to provide programs for those rising third through sixth grade students identified by their principals. And then they're gonna work on academic achievement for the first half of the day and the second half of the day, they will be in a summer camp. And the program takes place at New Horizons Elementary School. And Mr. Burke, Superintendent Burke, thank you for partnering with the Village of Wellington. This is outstanding. And I think a lot of the students that will be going to maybe school this summer will want to go to Wellington because it sounds like it's going to be a great, fun experience, but also an experience for improved academic achievement. And another thing that they're doing as I met with them, they're working on mental health for our children. They're working together with the uh, health uh, counselor. They've actually used their health uh, care dollars to actually provide a therapeutic uh, health counselor for the children in the village of Wellington, uh, where they'll have two sessions for two days a week. 
to help the students who may be going through some of the changes as it relates to the pandemic with unfinished learning, uh, which is social and emotional problems. They're working together with their community services department. And lastly, I just thank the Village of Wellington and partnering with the Boys and Girls Club to host the uh, academic uh, summer program. Outstanding work, Village of Wellington. Thank you for working with the school district of Palm Beach County to make sure our children are academically ready, they're healthy, and they're mentally ready as we move forward. And my last comment goes to Shelly Miller. She is the Florida Agriculture in the Classroom Award winner for 2022. She needs to come to the board. She is from Gove Elementary School, and she implements lesson plans throughout the school year that educate kindergarten through fifth grade students about Florida agriculture. The Agriculture Teacher of the Year coming from Gove Elementary School, hooray for Shelley Miller. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sanders. Vice Chairwoman Brill. Thank you. So I will just um, very briefly say that I know this is a time for families to be celebrating some holidays. So again, I want to reiterate that we wish everybody a, a happy Easter, Hag Sameach, Hag Pesach Sameach, and Ramadan Mubarak. So whatever holiday you are celebrating, we wish you all the very best. Thank you, Ms. Brill. Take us to agenda item speakers. We have seven. Call you three at a time. Please come up to the microphone. Watch the clock. You have three minutes, and please state your name when you begin. David Hansen, Arthur Zappix, excuse me, Zappasockney, and Maybeth Tech. They got me tonight. Tech Pua. Sorry if I slaughtered those names. Uh, hi, I'm David Hansen, uh, Superintendent Burke, and the board members. Uh, my wife and myself live in SAC 318, specifically the Santa Barbara community, with our children. Um, and uh, we're speaking uh, this evening or this afternoon uh, to request uh, for SAC 318 to stay in the Calusa Elementary instead of being removed uh, per the study that was uh, report or discussed prior that would move SAC 318 to the Blue Lake School. And one of the things that I wanted to point out was the reason why um, we are speaking at the 11th hour, literally, is because our SAC has really been under-informed that this process was happening and that our SAC was being rezoned or potentially rezoned to the Blue Lake Elementary School. And one of the um, items that is in the review of the study and the prior workshop um, stated that the last uh, Boundary Committee meeting had about 60 persons on that uh, video conferencing, and that over half were in favor of uh, the study and being, being uh, sorry, uh, for the study being accepted as it was. And um, I'll direct all the board members and the uh, superintendent to go back to that meeting and just count on your hand how many people from SAC 318 uh, were part of that video discussion. Um, and basically, our community hasn't been informed, and it's taken us a while for us to create a response and a request um, to stay um, at Calusa Elementary School. And uh, our board members uh, created a petition and they were going to address it to Dr. Or, uh, Superintendent Burke, um, but uh, it was being sent at March, right around the time the March 9th workshop was happening. So that's why we weren't there and able to address the board or the superintendent at that time. Um, it was shared with the mayor who suggested that uh, this had already been discussed and voted on and was, was no longer a potential um, item for us to address, um, which obviously isn't true because you all are meeting today to still read to discuss that. Um, but that's why we're coming late to the show. Um, but not only do we want to stay in the school district that we purchased our home for and that we expect our children to go to and not be rezoned, um, the study itself points out the fact that Calusa School District will be the most underutilized school in Boca, and yet it is one of the highest ranked elementary schools in Boca, which simply doesn't make sense. Um, okay, thanks. <laughs> um, and uh, even if you took the 109 students from the SAC 318 and, put, and kept them in uh, Calusa School District, the utilization would still be 87%, which is below every other school in Boca except J.C. Mitchell. And uh, so there literally is no reason to ask us to be removed. And doing so would be arbitrary and capricious. And so I request that we stay in our school district. That's it. Thank you. 
Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you, uh, Superintendent Burke. Uh, my name is Arthur Zapsochny. Um, Dr. Hansen asked me to come. I'm a board member of Santa Barbara. I represent the board of 220 homes in Santa Barbara. And I just want to say, as a person that only moved here less than a year ago, not only to Boca, but in Florida, uh, the reason why my wife and I, and I'm a father of three, uh, small, all under five years old, that we came here because of the school districts, um, people from New York. We didn't want to be in a position where we were being indoctrinated and, and also with mass mandates and various other things. Florida seemed like the right place for us. When we chose Boca, it was near both our in-laws. I just moved one of our in-laws near, near us as well from Michigan. And so we brought our infrastructure here for Boca. Uh, the Calusa School District is the number one school district in Boca. And people do choose schools, they don't choose homes. Uh, as, as even in my own experience as a young man in upstate New York, uh, I was, my parents instilled in me that schools are more important than, than living in a home. Uh, I can tell you right now the home that I lived in, uh, the school district was the number one school district around. And basically there was a lot of other homes with much lower values that they could have went to that were not much nicer. But that was the values that were instilled in me that the school district is the most important thing. We have 109 students that have the same values. These parents believe that the school district is far more important than the home they buy. And I'm pretty sure what will probably happen is, is people, especially people of means, will just move out of these places. So I implore you to please stay with it, what it how it is for, for a number of reasons. And I've also been told that it's possible that maybe we would want to keep some of the people that are older and, and not the other and all this hodgepodge stuff. In reality, I was a K through 12 student in a public education environment. I, some of my greatest friends were the people that I started in kindergarten with. To this day, I'm 40 years old. I implore people to understand that to break children, especially now with all this mental health, you want to have mental health, keep their friends together. That's what they should be doing. If we believe that, th that they had a negative experience with their friends, we as parents will move them out. Thank you so much. I don't need much more time. I yield it to you. I hope you guys vote to let us stay where we are because I do believe that a lot of people will move otherwise. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. May Beth to Capua, Ashley, Sarah. We did have 60 vote, you know, in a very short period of time. Of the 220, I got 60 vote, uh, people that signed, and it's another 65 or so. So about half the community signed in three days. You give me a week, I'll get all of them to sign. Please consider this. Thank you. Thank you. Janet D'Agostino. Jen Showalter, Kimberly Sosa. Hi, I'm Jen Showalter. I'm here as a daughter and sister of three public school teachers and two professors, a mom of three, two of which have special needs to discuss policy 5.181. This policy has some startling areas that need immediate clarification. In one section, it states specifically that items like straight jackets and zip ties aren't being used, but later states the use of those items shouldn't be to the point to restrict blood flow or airflow. So which is it? As a mom of two special needs kids and an advocate, this is a great concern to me, especially considering what our kids already go through. According to the National Center for Education Statistics, 31% of students between the ages of 12 to 18 in the country say they're bullied, but most stay silent. Disabled kids are two to three times more likely to be bullied than their non-disabled peers, and one in 10 cited repeated, repeated bullying as the reason they drop out. Kids with behavioral issues such as ADHD are often assumed to be bullied, and in most cases, it's their classmates egging them on in order to evoke a reaction. Not all students with cognitive disabilities have the ability to understand, identify, or report what's happening. As a mom of two on the spectrum, we dealt with this. And that leads to policies like this that don't address the real issues. Instead, they penalize and demonize special needs students. Stu schools refuse to accept assistance from local therapists offering to answer questions or for help from parents like myself who wanted to coordinate fundraising efforts for sensory rooms. It rejects the reality that for many students, they have physiological conditions 
that manifest in psychological tendencies. In a study of 1,584 kids with autism age 2 to 17, researchers reported 53% were aggressive and that sleep, sensory, and other underlying issues are responsible for the behaviors. The study found kids were most likely to lash out physically if they engaged in self-injury, had sleep or sensory problems. Other factors included the education of the caregiver, the presence of GI issues, and communication as well as social skills deficiencies. Micah Marzarek from the University of Missouri and her colleagues in the study stated the results suggested increased attention should be given to the identification and treatment of sleep problems, self-injury, and sensory problems in particular. So instead of addressing the physical causes, the board simply focuses on the behavior and punishes according to that standard. Instead of realizing that sensory rooms will greatly diminish the physical stresses on spectrum kids and in turn their behavior, the policy leaves kids emotionally broken and doesn't resolve core issues. They get labeled the bad kid by those who don't understand their medical conditions. Most staff don't have sufficient training. And considering that 1 in 26 to 40 have autism or sensory processing disorder, not to mention or uh, counting all the other disabilities, that's a problem. Thank you. Kimberly Sosa. That's the end of our speakers, Mr. Superintendent. Um, we'll move on to um, any board members wish to pull anything from consent at this point. We need a motion to approve the consent agenda. Motion by Mrs. Whitfield, seconded by Mrs. Andrews. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. New business, Mr. Superintendent, policy A-2. Yes, I recommend the board approve the development of proposed policy 5.181, policy for the use of physical restraint with students with disabilities. Motion. Motion. By Ms. Whitfield, seconded by Ms. Brill. Discussion? Ms. Brill? Well, the only thing that I, I want to bring up, first of all, is that we have to have this policy, that it's required. Um, there have been some changes that have to be incorporated in it. And separate from the policy, I just want to ask if, if Mr. Superintendent, if someone could get back to us. One of the emails that we received mentioned lives and balance training for educators. And so I would ask Mr. Superintendent if you would please have Mr. McCormick or somebody get back to us to explain what that is. Yes, absolutely. Thank we'll you. We'll follow up. Mrs. Mrs. Whitfield. I just think it's important for us to take a minute, um, if we can, have Mr. McCormick um, or Ms. Pincus talk us a little bit through uh, you know, some of the concerns that have been raised tonight. I want to make sure that people understand, you know, the reason why we do this, why we put this policy together. Um, if, you, if you could just take maybe a minute or two and, and talk about it. Before you do that, with General Counsel, would you please advise the public on the change that was made in the policy that was referenced tonight? Yes, there was uh, some language, and I think it was read by one of the speakers. That language has already been uh, changed, and that is what was adopted tonight. Uh, the uh, school district of Palm Beach County does not engage in mechanical restraints. Um, there was, um, the, the language had been misconstrued uh, in the former uh, language that was uploaded, and that has since been taken out. So the policy that we're approving tonight, that language has already been removed? Correct. Got it. Yes, I probably should have mentioned that. Thanks for explaining. That's why we had moved it to new business, so we could make those revisions. I know we alerted the board, but uh, maybe not the audience, so thank you. Probably remember that in 2007 we drafted the policy before the statute even existed when the statute came into existence it actually was pretty close to our policy in terms of monitoring and the things that we have in our policy regarding restraints of students with disabilities so we were the leader on this the policy the statute changed in 2011 we aligned our statute to that language the statute was changed again in 2021 our intent was simply to align with some language. And in doing so, the direction was, let's go ahead and mirror what the statute says, as we normally do. Unfortunately, there was missed in the beginning of the policy, it always says that we prohibited re uh, mechanical restraints. At the, towards the end of the policy, when we mirrored the state language, the state actually, to right now, does allow 
mechanical restraints. And that's the language that got put in, and it was an error. It was never intended that way, and it was actually inconsistent within our own proposed policy. My understanding is now the state is taking a look at also eliminating mechanical restraints, so we think that that is a good thing. Summarize. Thank you very much. That was perfect. Ms. Pearl. <clears throat> All I wanted to do is say thank you because um, years ago, some members of this board will remember um, that we had pa parents that came before us advocating for changes to the policy which we made. And long before the state required you to provide us with the data on a quarterly basis, you've been providing us with that so that we can see if a student has multiple restraints to try and figure out what's going on in that environment. And of course, there's oh, there always is are de-escalation methods that are used. It's not just that a child gets restrained. So I'm very proud of our policy. I think we've come a long way. And I'll turn it back over to Mr. McCormick. Thank you, Ms. Brill, and thank you for mentioning that piece. That's the one uh, aspect of this issue that I wanted to bring up this evening is our specific focus on prevention and de-escalation. This policy is in place to provide specific guidelines for staff when physically having to intervene. The most important part of this policy is the prevention and de-escalation aspects of how we do business to be able to do early intervention, get to know our children, build the relationships, do prevention strategies and then de-escalation strategies so we can completely eliminate having to um, implement restraint to begin with. So that is our priority. We continue to work on it daily. Thank you, Mr. McCormick. We support de-escalation across the board. All right. Absolutely. Mrs. Andrews. And I just have to personally thank Mr. McCormick and Attorney Pincus for the work that you do with our ESC children every day to make sure that we keep them safe. And certainly uh, the new policy that we put in place is just right so that we can protect our children. And that's what you've always done. And I sat here with Ms. Burrell on the board when we looked at our policies and procedures back in the day to make them a lot more user-friendly to take care of our children. So both of you are to be commended publicly tonight for the great work that you do in ESC. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Thank you both. Mr. Superintendent. That concludes our agenda. We need a motion to adjourn this special meeting? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, we didn't sorry. vote yet. Yeah, vote. I guess we need a vote on that. Um, all in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. We need a motion to adjourn. Motion by Mrs. Andrews, second by Mrs. Whitfield. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. Now call the meeting of the Palm Beach School Board Leasing Corporation to, um, to, to order. Um, the board clerk should indicate in the records that the six board members are currently still here. Um, Superintendent, we only have one item on the agenda, LC1. Yes, this is pretty straightforward. Uh, you know, we do this once a year to update the officer, the officers of the leasing corp, which aligns with our school board. I'm just pulling it up real quick. So I recommend the Palm Beach School Board Leasing Corp approve the slate of officers. Motion by Mrs. Whitfield, seconded by Mrs. Andrews. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. We need a motion to adjourn. Motion by Mrs. Whitfield, seconded by Mrs. Andrews. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? This meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Everybody drive you. carefully. Six to nine months, while seedlings are typically grown in nursery beds for two to three years before transplanting into the field. Once in the field, it takes about three to four years for the plant.